welcome you all for this uh, uh, very special lecture in the evening um, by Professor Richard Zaire from Stanford University. And tomorrow he is giving a colloquium at four right here. Uh, that will be more research talk. And today he's going to talk about Stanford. So uh, <clears throat> uh, thank you for, for coming, uh, joining for, for this special uh, lecture. And uh, I, uh, so Professor Zaid, who is also known uh, as Dick, uh, is visiting India, all IISERs, as uh, the Yusuf Hamid uh, Professor, uh, awarded by the Royal Society London. And I'm very grateful to him that he has been able to uh, visit us. And uh, of course, uh, Dick is uh, a prolific scientist of our time, and he needs no introduction. But the, for the benefit of uh, my younger colleagues and students, I'd like to say a few words about uh, Dick. So uh, early in his uh, career, he uh, frequently moved uh, between the East Coast and uh, the Rocky Mountains. Uh, so he did his bachelor's from Harvard University. And then he did his post-graduation at the University of California, Berkeley. And uh, then he returned to Harvard for his PhD. He obtained his PhD in 1964. And uh, then he had a brief, uh, of course, I must say that I have done some research using PhD tree analysis, which reveals that uh, he uh, belongs to the academic lineage of Linus Pauling. And uh, after his uh, brief postdoctoral stint at the University of Colorado, he joined the faculty of MIT in 1965. And in 1966, he moved to Colorado, uh, holding a joint faculty position at the departments of chemistry, physics, and astrophysics. And uh, he uh, then moved to uh, Columbia. He was appointed to the professorship, full professorship at Columbia in 1969. And he remained in, uh, uh, at Columbia till 1977 when he moved to Stanford. And uh, he has been there ever since. And he was named chair of the chemistry department of Stanford in 2005. And he was also awarded prestigious Howard Hughes Medical Investigator HHMI professor in, nine, in 2006. And of course, under his tutelage, uh, Stanford chemistry has done very well. And he has written an article in Current Science several years ago about uh, Stanford recruitment and promotion, which I think everybody should read. So <coughs> he uh, is uh, very renowned for his uh, groundbreaking research in uh, laser chemistry. And he made some trailblazing discoveries in reaction dynamics using laser-induced fluorescence. And uh, of course, uh, his uh, you know, seminal contributions uh, uh, in research is very unique in some sense that his uh, you know, research enterprise uh, uh, intersects a variety of contemporary and fascinating aspects of modern chemistry, uh, physics, biology, and medicine. And I'm really delighted uh, to uh, have uh, Professor Zia visiting us. And for his uh, uh, prodigious scient uh, scientific accomplishments, he has been recognized, widely recognized by various awards, fellowships, and memberships. That includes uh, the National Academy of Science USA, which was in 1976, I believe. And then, of course, American uh, uh, Academy of Arts and Science and uh, various other uh, very uh, highly renowned agencies like uh, the World Jewish uh, uh, Academy of Sciences and uh, then American uh, Association for the Advancement of Science and uh, American Physical Society, American Chemical Society and there is a long list of his uh, accomplishments. So what I would like to tell you 
that he has also been quite interested in Indian academia, and he has been writing articles in uh, a, a journal of uh, you know in a Bangalore Academy called Current Science. He is also a foreign member of the Royal Society, Chemical Research Society of India, uh, Chinese Academy of Sciences, and also Indian Academy of Sciences, Bangalore. And uh, he has also written an article on IIACR several years ago. I think all of you should uh, go back and take a look. And I'm really delighted that he has agreed to give two lectures, uh, especially this general lecture on Stanford, which will be of great importance to us uh, as a young uh, institution and, of course, other established institutions in the region. And uh, thanks, Dick, for accepting our invitation. Over to you, Dick. Thank you. Um, great. Those of you in the back, come on forward. There's nothing built unless you don't want to. Really, come. There's there's seats. You're you're, you're running away. <laughs> and uh, uh, you'll do better. Uh, I, I have nothing to show you for reasons that are beyond my control. <laughs> my computer crashed, <laughs> so all the talks I prepared don't, don't, are gone. <laughs> Anyways, I, I I love this opportunity to talk to you about Stanford. And I did want to explain some of my feelings about what Stanford does so well, because uh, I think it does. But it's not the only institution that does well in my own country. Um, maybe I should start by telling you uh, an experience I had in Germany. I was uh, spending, uh, as a visiting professor, at uh, the Goethe University in Frankfurt. Okay? And we went with another professor, Professor Brutsche is his name, physical chemist at the time, okay, to drink Appelvoy, that's sort of a uh, uh, alcoholic apple juice, fermented apple juice uh, in, in Sachsenhausen. And after a couple of apple juices, he says to me, do you realize, he says, that German universities on the average are much better than American universities? And I uh, thought about this, and I said, well, I, I think actually you're probably right that that's true. But I said that the best universities, however, are in the US. <laughs> and that, that is, I think, a, a fact. Uh, it, it's so. And of course, that made him angry at me. <laughs> that's not what he wanted to, me to say. <laughs> and so some universities do things quite well, and others not. What's the difference? I think I should start by trying to tell you something about the history of Stanford. It's a very strange history, uh, story, uh, a very, if, you, if you'd like, a very American story, as I'll try to point out. At least I think of it that way. Um, it comes from the fact that uh, Leland Stanford Sr., okay, and his wife, Jane Lothrop Stanford, had only one son. Leland Stanford Jr., for which the university is named. <laughs> okay, and this son, at about age 17, uh, died. I think it was of uh, some, I don't know, there was cholera or typhoid in Italy. And it came to his father, who at this time was what we call a robber baron, a person who had a monopoly of all the railroads in the West with some other people. He controlled all the railroads and he had a very simple pricing policy. The more money you had, the more he charged you. <laughs> this quickly made him quite wealthy. <laughs> and this was the nature. And it's because of Stanford that we have anti-monopoly laws in the United States, actually. Okay. But it took a while for that to happen. Anyways, so he has this, and he's been, he was really quite involved with railroads, as I'll explain to you further. He's the person who drove the Golden Spike in Promontory, Utah, that connected the East and West Railroads. Uh, he brought in Chinese workers to build his railroad. Uh, to give you a sense, sense, because I don't, of the times, he considered the Chinese people to be subhuman, okay? And treated him as such, but they were good for building railroads and things of that sort. 
So, and I'm just going to give you the sense of the time and what it's like. And uh, he's not a person I would have wanted to be trapped in an elevator with. Okay. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm, I'm not here to glorify the, the Stanford, but I'm explaining. Their only son died, and it came to him in a dream that he should take his horse ranch, okay, which was which is in where, where Stanford now is, and turn it into a university. This was amazing because no one had any idea he knew anything about universities before that. But his son was quite unusual. His son tended to collect birds and stuff them and, and seemed to be very much a naturalist, and he decided this was, was right. Now, there's no airplanes at the, at the time. We're talking about, what, 18... You're, you're better at history than, than I am at this. It's in 1885, approximately, or so. All right. Okay, Sam, Sam Rattle will correct me on this. And anyways, so he has to go by ship, and they go by ship, and the first place they go to is Boston to talk with, at that time, the president of Harvard. Um, I don't remember who it was, Lowell or whatever. And the, the normal ending of the story would be that there should be now a Stanford wing in Cambridge, Massachusetts. That should be the normal end. But what happened is they got into a big argument over dinner. <laughs> what was the argument about? Stanford said he wanted to create this university, which he, he wanted advice how to do this, but he wanted a university which would be attended by both men and women. This is 1885, 80, whatever, whatever, sometime like this. And the president of Harvard said, you can't do that, you can't be serious. He says, I'm very serious. Back in the frontier, it's very important, after all, half the population's women, very important that we have educated women as well as educated men to help make things happen, and that's what I want to do. And the president of Harvard shook his head and says, don't you understand? If there are young women around, young men can't study. <laughs> okay. So, so here we are <laughs> with this situation. Um, and so he went off, and he managed to get, at that time, a person who was the president of Cornell, uh, that was already in the wilds, to agree, David, David Starr Jordan, to come out to Stanford to be its first <laughs> president and to start to build the place. And uh, uh, if you've ever seen pictures of Leland Stanford Sr., you would understand he's much overweight, he's a hard drinker, <laughs> he doesn't live very long. Um, they, they set out the uh, campus by uh, hiring a person who is famous for, for, for his uh, ability to build things, a man by the name of Frederick Law Olmsted. Olmsted built Central Park in New York City. He built Golden Gate Park in San Francisco. He's built other parks. Guess what? When you come to Stanford, and I hope you will visit if you haven't already, you'll find it's a park. <laughs> it's laid out as a park, okay? <laughs> well, as I say, Mr. Stanford didn't last long, and Mrs. Stanford soon fired <laughs> uh, Frederick Law Olmsted, and, but the plans were put into place, and you see some of it in terms of the architecture. They did not know to build a replica of something like Cambridge or Oxford or Heidelberg. So it's actually built in uh, uh, Spanish um, Californian style. And that's the nature of, of the way it is. You, you're gonna look for some pictures? They, they are probably, or, uh, a, point, a pointer, yeah. And, and, uh, oh good, can I use the pointer? Can I just use the pointer? Uh, well, you want me to come up? I, I, don't, I sort of don't want to come up, I, if you don't mind. I'd rather be with you. Um, okay. Well, I, I, I just want to show he, here. Now, how, how do we make this work? Here, hardly see it. That's the Hoover Tower in the background. This is the uh, quadrangle of Stanford. Uh, uh, Hoover, Hoover was in the entering class. And indeed, Stanford opened co-ed in about, I'm trying to remember, 1890-something, okay? Uh, 
95 on that order. And so it's a relatively young university. It is not the first co-ed university. Uh, it turns out that Berkeley, UC California at Berkeley, was already co-ed. And so this was a very much a feeling of what was going on in the West. I, I'm giving you a background of, of this situation. Now, when I was a graduate student at Berkeley, and I was, uh, Stanford was a nice place to visit. It was beautiful, but it was sleepy. Nothing much was happening. Uh, what really took off was uh, the vision of the president and the provost. And therefore, I want to emphasize something to you that, that's, that's key, seriously key. You, if you're young, you don't pay attention much to the administration. I did anyways. In fact, you sort of look down at them because they're not doing what's active from your viewpoint of trying to advance knowledge. <laughs> okay, but it turns out they really determine very much the course of how the institution grows. So they're actually very, very important. And it was uh, the, these people, Sterling and Terman, who had the vision that they were going to take a gamble and use federal soft money at, at the end of World War II to make Stanford into a research university. And so based on soft money, not money that they had, they started to build up and they supported such things. They supported such things as the Hewlett and Packard now of HP and so on, and Agilent that split apart, Varian, uh, and other things of this that, that started, which we now see are the seeds of Silicon Valley. I'm trying to get you the, the sense of it. And so in time, Stanford became quite wealthy and quite strong. I, I'm gonna, I, I really need to have, have in some sense you be willing to ask me questions as I go on as to what's happening, because I, I think it's better that way. Um, I'm, I'm not, as you see, totally prepared what to say. I, I think what I want to do next is to, to go back and tell you something about my department, if I might. First of all, Stanford Chemistry Department, it really is a strong department. And let's get over something. Let, let's all of us try to get over something. People are always worried about, is it the best? This is, this is a trap. Don't worry about the best. The question you really want to ask yourself is, can you make a situation better, not best? I, I mean it, seriously. <laughs> you do better that way. You, you, you do. You fall into all types of problems if you say, I'm going to become the best. No one, you can't have all be the best, but you can all get better. And there are different things in education that you need to do in different places and different things to satisfy, okay? Um, after all, you're set up to, at the moment to be an ICER, not an IIT. And th there's a difference <laughs> as to what the goals are. And you should be willing to embrace that and do that and so forth. Anyways, to continue with Stanford, um, uh, oops, I'm going to tell you. The, uh, I thought I would next explain something about my department. It is highly international. Now, what do I mean by that? Um, we have in my department at the moment faculty members, of which I can think of, um, let's see, two that come from India. We lost a third one, BJ Pandey, who's decided to become a venture capitalist. Okay, <laughs> it's left our department. We used to have three. We have uh, about three people from China on my faculty. I have another who doing different things. Okay, I have another person from Guatemala who's on, on my department. That's Todd Martinez, who's a theoretical chemist. Uh, and, I, and I have Tom Markland, who comes from the UK. I have Steve Boxer, who comes from Chicago. <laughs> okay, I'm trying to give you a, a picture of things. And, and Mike Fair, et cetera. Uh, I'm trying to think of uh, things to tell you uh, about it. it. It's really a mixture of things, and it's even more of a mixture if I start to look at the student body. About one-third the students that are graduate students are foreign, okay? And in my own research group, I have all different types of nationalities. In fact, I would tell you probably in my own research group, People who are not American outnumber those who are American, okay? Which is fine, 
because what we're after at Stanford is finding the best students that we can. And I'll show you some more of that diversity as we go on. It's less so in undergraduates. Undergraduates were ori originally free at Stanford. That didn't last with economic times. Now it costs a great deal of money to go to this private institution. Um, how does this institution run? Maybe, maybe that's useful to say. Um, well, the person who is at the top is the president. Okay, and I happen to have a house on campus. About 700 faculty live on the campus. The campus, incidentally, is about a square mile in, in size. And it's large. Most of it actually not built on. <laughs> okay? And uh, I happen to live right next to the president. So I'm seeing my fifth president. I have transient neighbors. And... Uh, <laughs> And, uh, okay, and, uh, but the president primarily is the person who looks outside and represents Stanford to the outside, as I saw it. A uh, person interested in trying to raise money. Please notice again how Stanford got built up. It comes from philanthropy. And this is something that's quite remarkable that I've seen in the US. There's very much a sense that people make a lot of money and then later on, they give it back in some way or another. So Bill Gates makes a great deal of money, and then you have the Gates Foundation. Did you see what I'm trying to say? And uh, I hope you don't mind me saying that I don't see the same in India. I see people making a lot of money in India, and I don't see it going the same way back. This is, should be fixed, in my opinion, because you really should be building Indian society. And that spirit hasn't yet been as much developed here. And I think you'd gain if you could uh, do that. In, in hmm? To give it to Cornell. <laughs> Not India. Well, that doesn't make, you know, that isn't right, in my opinion. You really do want to build. And, and it's, well, it's going to be your challenge, <laughs> I think. It, 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 you can. It's very important. You graduate alumni. I think alumni should be celebrated and remembered and be grateful for what they got from being here. We, we, we do that very strongly at Stanford. We have a Stanford family. We, we welcome all people who spent time at Stanford and we gain from it all. Yes, it's true, a few people give most the money. That is how it works. But we really want everyone involved and, and we get that very strong. So the way we Stanford raises money is that it comes from um, uh, three sources, if I can do it, if I can do it, remember it. Uh, one source is through its endowment. Its endowment has been built up by people who've given it money and what it's invested in, things of this sort. Another source comes from tuition, what it charges, various things. And uh, the, the, the third source comes from overhead, <laughs> the federal government for contracts and such. Um, and again, as a young person, when I first started, I thought overhead was dreadful. It should be zero. Why are you taking money which should be used for research <laughs> and spending it elsewhere? And then as you get older, you get to realize, well, this money is really necessary to make a whole institution work, okay? And you can argue about percentages, but that's the sort of picture you have of what's going on. That's the president. The president does not involve himself in the day-to-day -day operations, much of the university. This is, and I think this is in some sense a contrast to what I think happens, I have to find out as I visit the other ICERs, but from what I can tell, each ICER director has to approve things to make it happen. And this is, I, we don't get approval from our president, okay, about anything unless it's large. And, Okay, they're trying to give a, a difference here. And so who, who, what happens? Where's the approval? What's happening? Well, there's a next person called a provost. You may have here a deputy director. I, I'm not sure it's the same or not. I, I'm trying to learn the structure. And this is my first visit to, 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 on this trip to an ICER, so I don't know yet. I need to, hmm? Deans. Oh, okay. And we have deans also under the provost. And I need to explain to you the nature of Stanford in that it has seven schools all together. So what are these schools? 
Well, I belong to the School of Humanities and Sciences. Okay. Uh, next to it is uh, the School of Engineering. And then what else? There is the School of Medicine. Well, we have a hospital on campus and have training of doctors and all that that's going on. We have an education school, hold them up to four. Okay. I have a business school, that's five. And earth sciences is six. And now I've left something out. <laughs> no, that's part of the humanities and sciences. Oh, law, thank you. That's what I forgot. There's a, there's a law school. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay, so there's seven. And the barriers between the various schools are low. People from different departments different, can come and join different research groups. And there's lots of talk among the faculty. The faculty is really relatively small. Uh, and, uh, okay, make a guess in your head. How many Stanford faculty do you think there are in chemistry? Okay. All of chemistry. And so you, you come up. And so the answer is 24. Okay. Very lean number of faculty. And about of these 24, 18 are what we have are called tenure, six are untenured yet. Okay? We have a couple, we have about four people who are so called lecturers that are not faculty but are involved also in instruction. I'm, tr I'm trying to give you a, a picture of it all. So, Let's now, for fun, discuss how we do hiring. And what what is it like? Because uh, you you will be interested, in, I think, some of you in this and, and the, what what it's after. Uh, so let's just about talk about faculty hiring. Then we'll talk about how students get selected. I, I hope I can do all this and remember to do it. Help me if I forget. So let's see, hiring of faculty. So I was chair of the chemistry department, so I really have confidence. I did that for, 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 for six years. Okay, I'm not chair now. <laughs> okay, and uh, so I, I have a strong feeling, a sense of this. Um, we hire by first publicly advertising. And indeed, in the United States, that's what goes on. Every institution must publicly advertise. And, and, okay, now you have an ad. You get hundreds of applications. We read the applications, and we're most interested in these applications by trying to look for candidates as to what they've done and what people say about them who are writing letters. And of these, in, you know, what different fields, and often there'll be a need, often driven by what we need to teach. We need to teach um, inorganic chemistry, therefore we're looking for somebody who will be able to do that, and that rules out certain groups and brings other groups up. And it varies as to what the needs are. Do I, okay, okay? So now, of these, we select only four or five candidates for one position. And we invite these candidates to come and interview with us. Please, I'd like you to. And, and is there a microphone you can use so everybody hears you? Does this work? Let's turn it on and make it work. I really want to have inter interaction. Like when you do hiring, in that process, do you also think about to, to create a niche area in particular groups or subgroups? Oh, yes. So, so, so let, let, me, let me answer that. What we're really interested in, and as I was going to try to tell you, is we're interested in, in uh, whether or not this person will be a seed in chemistry that makes something new happen. And this is hard because there always are faculty members, I have them in my department, who want clones, who want people who do just what they're doing because that's what's most important, of course, because that's why they're doing it. Okay, this is something to be fought against. To help us fight against that, we often ask someone outside our department to join us in this process of looking at the candidates. It is really good to have an outside person somebody from biology, somebody from physics, somebody from material science, come and join us. It's only one person. That person has no vote. But I'll tell you, it greatly makes people behave better. 
<laughs> if there's an outsider, <laughs> at least among my faculty, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and it's useful that way. And it elevates the, and, and then it stops these people who say, I only want to have somebody who only does what I do. Okay, enough of that, okay? We wanna, so yes, I hope I'm giving you a, a sense now. And then we listen to these people and we have them present a public lecture, it can be attended by anybody, that's primarily on uh, often their graduate or postdoctoral work, okay? And what we're looking for is can they communicate? Can they teach? Because teaching really matters to us. As I told you, one of our major ways of getting, um, okay, <laughs> of getting uh, funds is through tuition and having happy alumni. So teaching matters to us a great deal. We, we are then have another session which is closed with the, just the faculty, incidentally all faculty, in which they try to describe what type of research they want to do. And what's interesting is first of all, can they excite the faculty? The candidate that wins is the candidate which other faculty say, wow, we never thought of that, that's really neat. Then they go for that person. That, that, that's the nature of what, I, what I've seen in terms of hiring. I hope I'm giving you a sense of this. Um, please, so, uh, with, the, we, with the microphone. Yeah. I, okay. It works. Good. So we pretty much do the same thing, uh, at least at IISCR Mohali. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, uh, is it possible for all your faculty colleagues to go through the each application, read some of the best papers? How do you do that? No, we have a small committee a subgroup search of faculty, committee. a search committee, which I'm telling you, often we have somebody from the outside join that search committee to yeah. present to us the five candidates, which we then, as a whole faculty, interview. And they go through all the papers? They go, they go through all the applications. Okay. Okay. In my, yes. And so some of the worked. best papers uh, published by the candidate during the PhD or the postdoctoral uh, Right, right. And I, I thought I would now go on and, and tell you ab about an American system involving tenure. Um, I am not, oh, sure, let's get a microphone to you. Well, you, know, you do need a microphone. My question is, do you also look at the age of the applicant? Uh, 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 I, I think we do in the, in the following sense. There, there's, there's not supposed to be any age discrimination, but people naturally are looking, if they're appointing a new faculty member, that it'd be somebody who would be relatively young, okay? Otherwise, it'd be called a senior faculty member, which we also search for. But yes, we, we do make distinctions that well, way. Age, is it the biological age or the academic age? It, it's much more, much more the academic age than biological age, if you understand. That's right. I, I, under, I forgot to tell you, the reason I'm probably still active is because there is no retirement in my country. No, 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 this is a serious, okay? Very different than, than almost everywhere else. Um, I will in November be 80, okay? I'm actually very old, <laughs> I'm sorry to say, <laughs> okay? And believe me, uh, this is what I'm gonna lead to. Some people at age 40 or 50 cease doing much. <laughs> and other people, <laughs> no, okay, and some people go on. I hope I'm going on, okay? <laughs> you can judge later. <clears throat> I don't think it's very important how often the Earth goes around the sun <laughs> in terms of measuring the activity of somebody. I actually, it's gonna lead to, I don't totally believe in the tenure system. As I'll get to, but I want to first describe it to you so you make sure you understand it. After we hire somebody, we uh, wait until, oh, something like less than seven years have gone by, but often around the fifth or sixth year, we start asking for making a decision. Do we want to keep this person in our faculty or not? And happily, this is true, true throughout the American universities. And that's part of what makes it work, is that people can go from one university to another. If you can't do that, then this system will not work, what I'm describing to you. Uh, and what else I wanna tell you? What do we judge people on? We are primarily a research university. 
we want people to be great researchers. I mean it. And what does it mean to be a great researcher? For us, it means that when we send out letters to outside people, we get back letters that say, this person did something which really changed how we view the field. Okay? We don't ask, this is serious, we don't look at the H factor, which it seems to be so prevalent among people's considerations. We don't care about it. We care about, is there something that's been done that matters? I, 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 I give you many examples of where the H factor is, H index is a, is a trailing factor, not a leading factor in how well people do things. Okay? And um, so here I am. I, I have an H index somewhere over 100. I don't know what it is. Uh, and I don't actually care that much. Um, and, and I'm telling you, that's not what's important. And it's not what's important to my faculty. We also don't care about how much money the person has brought in, because that varies with the field, okay? I mean, it depends. If you're in astronomy, <laughs> there's a different amount of funds that you'll get than if you're doing theory in, in some area. Uh, and, and different than somebody who needs ex has experimental needs, and it varies. And we are not tied up with the money. We're tied up with, I told you, this idea of, of greatness, of being able to, ch to change how people have seen the field. And that's the first criterion. The second criterion is we want people who can be good teachers. As I pointed out to you, not great teachers. We're happy if you're a great teacher, but we want for what we're doing, good teachers. And anybody can be a good teacher if they want to be. And in a matter of encouraging people, we have means of helping people become good teachers by, for example, televising, using a video of the lecture that they give or in the class. And a person who comes and does this video who belongs to the university, but it is confidential and private and gives back comments, okay? Not, doesn't go, go, to the, go to the chair of the department, doesn't go to the administration, stays with the individual. I hope I'm making clear. It, that, that investment costs money, but it really pays off in changing people's teaching uh, and to get that type of feedback. And um, I know I, I, I'm just telling you, I was dealing with a person who, who, who uh, I don't want to mention names, person came from China, great researcher, bad teaching, I went to, it was a man, I went to him and I said to him, you're not going to make it this way, okay? I want you to make it. Instantly, we only hire, we only hire people that we want to ultimately make tenure. Our goal is not, we're not running a contest among those who, are, who we've hired <laughs> as to who will stay. At Stanford, we want those to, everyone we hire, we want to grow. And, and uh, it, he's changed and become quite, quite successful and he enjoys it now. I might tell you something else that, that may come as a bit of a surprise. Some people think that teaching and research are in opposition, that it, teaching steals your research time. Actually, I think it's quite the contrary. I think teaching is a secret weapon for doing research. And why do I say that to you? When you teach, you've got to ask yourself, how will you know something? Is it really what you're saying? what remains next to learn, and it forces you yourself to deeply understand the topic and to ask the type of questions which are the same questions you get involved in research. Do you believe what that, <laughs> those measures, what's the meaning of that, and so forth. So they go together in my mind, they don't go apart. And um, so I don't think there's a problem that way when you view it this way, okay? Uh, the third thing we ask is, community service. I, I'm, I, let me explain. If the person is a, a nasty colleague, <laughs> people are not going to want this person. This, okay? But, so this is, a, this is the lowest bar <laughs> what I, I'm trying to get to, but we do care. We want people, because each, each department I've given you, I only have 24 faculty, they got to live with each other. We want them to, to have what we call collegial interactions, okay, a collegiality. Um, so I've given you some picture of that sort. sort. Now, for fun, let me try next to, to tell you about the Stanford Chemistry Department, 
as an example of a department. It has, as I said, 24 faculty. How many graduate students do you think it has? 50, 100, okay, it, 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 each, each group's average size is about 15. It's 300 some or more graduate students. You, you agree with, you, okay? It's, so very rich in graduate students. Do you follow? And this leads to something that you want, might wanna think about, because it's different from what I've seen, so far what I've seen in India. What I see in India is that you tend to have much smaller groups, okay? Um, and, and again, some people say, I don't want a large group because it takes away from my time in some way. Well, we, no, I, I really gain as a, as a whole group myself, feel strongly uh, in building that. And people do this. We have large groups, and if I count postdocs, I get even uh, over 400 some people. So a huge amount that way. Uh, so what about undergrads? And the number of chemistry majors we make are really relatively small. And I'm, I'm not proud of this fact. We tend to make 15 to 20 majors, chemistry majors we graduate each year. Not much at all. We have an undergraduate body of about 7,000, okay? And chemistry is not the most popular major at all. Computer science is too late lately, okay? <laughs> uh, just to, to say what I've, what I've seen. Uh, uh, all the schools, all the schools is what I'm trying to tell you. Um, and now I, I'm, I'm, I think what I want to do is try to go up here and show you some of the facts. But maybe before I do that, have I, is there something you want to ask? Please, let's have a microphone that we can give somebody. Well, I think there's people way in the back that won't come forward. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for being so forthright and um, expressing these things. So my question is, at, at some point in your talk, you said that uh, you actually uh, look in the faculty hiring process for four candidates um, to fill eventually one tenured position. And then uh, later on in the talk, you also said, but we only uh, invite those people whom we want to uh, eventually make as uh, faculty colleagues. Oh, the, so after how do we you manage appoint the them, two? After we appoint them, maybe I'm making, making clear. Ah, okay, after so we appoint them, we only appoint people who we want to go on. And once can. appointed, they're regular, they cannot be uh, then terminated? Yes, Is they that... can through a tenure process that I was describing. Yeah. So uh, okay. uh, as I mentioned. Now, my own, my own opinion is I would like to, to change the tenure process. Then, you know, good luck, I'm not gonna succeed. But I'll explain. I think it is very important, personally, not to make a decision after one year. I'll tell you why. In one year, people are building a lab often or doing other things. They can't do much and show you much. I really want to, if you're looking for to make the best, I'd like to have it longer if you can. Now, you, you may decide you want to do it a different way, that you'll make a matter of promotions depending on this instead of this, because you, as I say, you, you have to have everybody working the same way or it won't work. There's no, it is, it's cruel otherwise. Okay, let's go on. Uh, I would like then, say after the, the, the period of time, we have around seven years, to give a long-term appointment. Say an appointment like 20 or 30 years. The, the appointment or contract of that sort, it's like tenure, but it, it actually has an end. It tends to end around sometime it, in normal ages around 60, somewhere, with a spread, because I'm not measuring it by biological age, I am measuring it by academic age, but I'm trying to explain. It, it, somewhere there's a spread like that. And at that point, you should then go to a system where you ask people, have they uh, make appointments for the next five years or three years, something like this, so that you, because people stop, or need, people need to have a way to stop too. And there should be a way of making it part-time at the end. Uh, better for many people. After all, people do wear out. <laughs> okay, uh, and I, so I don't think the present American system's right, but hey, <laughs> here I am. <laughs> so, but I'm gonna tell you what it is, yeah. So one quick question is, uh, how much autonomy a department or school uh, has as opposed to the uh, university? 
Okay. Is it a federal system? It, um, it really is, very, very much. And I was trying to tell you that, that while the provost sits with the day-to-day -day operations, things go to the deans, and really they go to the department chairs, and the deans depend on the department chairs. Uh, to make things run in a large things. Also the faculty appointment and... Uh, that, that's right, so the, fac the faculty appointments go, go through a process, but they, they really are initiated from the bottom up, from the department, okay? Now, let me make some more statements that, that, that I think will interest you. Um, I believe in departments. Departments are the keepers of the truth of whatever tr area they're in, if it's biology, they know what's important in biology. If it's astrophysics, it's clear what that's about and so forth. These are the people who care most passionately about that field. But, okay, but I believe that having said that about departments, the department should not look inwards, but look outwards. And therefore, I strongly am a proponent of interdisciplinary centers things that involve often people from more than one department. Real problems, as I'm going to try to illustrate to you uh, tomorrow, I guess in the lecture, don't get solved by just today, generally, one discipline. They require lots of things being put together. You need to really go after solving problems that matter. And for that purpose, you, you want to take advantage of all the things you can to make it go. Um, and there's lots of combinations. A lot of the most successful things are there. Uh, I'm one of the people who is a founder of something called BioX. And I thought I'd, I'd try to tell you, just for fun, the history of BioX. BioX starts with uh, a colleague in physics by the name of Steve Chu uh, at that time. And Chu had an offer from the University of Chicago to go build a biophysics institute. And he called a couple people together into his office. Lucy Shapiro from the medical school, Jim Spudich from the, also from the medical school. Uh, and Spudich has spent a lot of time in Bangalore, so you, so you may know him and, and Anna, his wife. And anyways, uh, and he called me, and we, four of us sat down. And why should he stay at Stanford? After all, Stanford isn't going to make a biophysics, and he wants to make, go in this new direction. He already has a Nobel Prize in physics. He wants to go in this new direction, okay? And we began discussing this, and I said, you know, there's a lot of other bio things than just biophysics. I said, there's biochemistry, and then we began to talk about some more, and there's bioinformatics, and there's bioengineering, and I said, well, you know, there's so many, why don't we call it Bio X, and I actually made up, <laughs> I think, the name, <laughs> and it caught on. And we started, pretty soon, we decided for X was the unknown and a variable, we would go after Bio X. And it was the faculty who bought into this and presented this to the provost, to the deans, the provost, and to the president. Now, it was the president who made it happen further because he was able to get this fellow Jim Clark a computer scientist who had done Netscape. There was something called Netscape, okay? <laughs> Before Microsoft put it out of business. <laughs> it was the first browser, okay, <laughs> type of thing. And, and anyways, he, he put up a, a lot of money uh, to make this happen. And you can't do this without all the money. You need that, you need to buy, buy in. Now, the, the president is actually reports to a board of, 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 of trustees of, of Stanford. There's, a, there's trustees. These trustees are, are, are people who are generally quite powerful people who have, uh, have some connection with Stanford and want to preserve Stanford as an institution. It's interesting. The trustees is a body which appoints itself. It keeps renewing itself by appointing other people to be trustees. The trustees do not concern themselves with the day-to-day -day operations of the university. They, they're trying to make it, keep the university in a big picture. So at that time, uh, our new our president, uh, Gerhard Casper, presented BioX, but he said the name's wrong because he said, I don't want anything that is X-rated to be at Stanford. <laughs> 
but the board of trustees said they liked the name. <laughs> so it's stuck, and it's gone on since. And it's sort of become now a word in the vocabulary, uh, I believe. Uh, it's interesting how, the, how that goes. But that's the example of an interdisciplinary institute. Some people felt threatened by this. And indeed, I, I had the experience at that time. Um, an organic chemist who was uh, ch chair of my department said to me, if you're going to be involved in this, you're leaving, you're, you're really diluting chemistry, going away from chemistry, has a view that, see, takes away. I, I think differently. Instead of having the view that chemistry can do all this more, it was, don't do this. You're leaving, <laughs> you know, where the truth is kept in the department. Now, these are the choices that you have to make. Uh, and they're, but they're important. And so it, Stanford now is full of different centers, and they're powerful, I, be I believe. That you, you'll see them all over the place at Stanford. The centers do not give PhDs. That comes from the department. The educational part is in the department, not in the center. But the center is a very strong research component. Okay. So one okay. would be interested. One would be interested to know how these differences are reconciled in the department and in the center. Well, like like all differences, you know, they're reconciled sorta, right? Some peace is made. Not everybody's always happy. <laughs> it's it, it's a, there's tension. There, there, okay, between these views, and I wanted to share them with you. You you have uh, a the, uh, question is. Uh, when you elaborated about the tenure track, yeah. in some cases, assistant associate professor, that associate yeah. is skipped. Can you please talk a oh. little bit more? How do you decide sure, sure. to let, make let somebody me, me a that. professor even in three so years? So we hire people generally I I who are beginning, unless you make a senior hire, which comes with tenure. Okay, we hire as an assistant professor, and after, um, as I say, on the order of five to seven years, they are made as an associate professor with tenure. Now, an associate professor can go on and on, but our expectation and our hope is, once again, the associate professor will, after about five years or so, become a full professor. Uh, in that's some cases, you skip that if somebody is very good. How do you decide that? Uh, we, we are, uh, we, how do we retain faculty, or how do we, I'm not sure I'm understanding. In some cases, I have seen yes. somebody from assistant to professor in three years, mm -hmm. in some places, in your university, if you have done that, or in your department, if you have done that, how did you do it? It's often, I'm, I'm, being, I'm being honest, that has happened because somebody has made a breakthrough that's, that's immediately celebrated, okay? That can happen. Or this person has received an offer from another institution. <laughs> I'm trying to tell you how it is, okay? Huh? Well, uh, that's right, often after the breakthrough. <laughs> but, and, and so they go together in, in ways. So that's how you can get very rapid advancement that way. But otherwise, normally not. Coming back to the earlier question which was asked that uh, how differences are resolved, how, uh, the, is the decision-making process in the department democratic? Do people vote and uh, does, how does it work when there is a two contending uh, R issues. R right. How do you no, go we, about we, resolving? We have departmental faculty meetings. Somebody gets appointed as chair. I might ask. I might tell you how the chair at Stanford works, because that's important. Because how did I get to be chair? Uh, for example, uh, I was the chair at Stanford, and all the departments is appointed by the dean by a vote of the faculty. And when I was, the dean often interviews individual faculty members as to who they'd want to be a good chair. And when I was interviewed, I said I didn't care who would be chair because I thought my department was not functioning well and it wouldn't matter. <laughs> and later on, I was called back by the dean who said, we, I agree with you, the department's not functioning well. <laughs> we want you to fix it <laughs> and I will help you fix it. <laughs> Okay, uh, and that was made me decide. I, okay, I I didn't imagine I was going to become D, uh, become chair. I decided I tried to be chair, and and uh, it's, uh, I hope I'm answering your, your your question about that to, to see what's happening. That's how the chairs go. Chairs in my in, in, in are about three years. Uh, that's enough time. You don't want it too short. You, you can't. It takes a while to understand everything. 
um, that, that goes on. And, we, and you, de you, de you want faculty to be with you in making something to work. Yes, you need a microphone. Sir, can you please tell us something about the student hiring process? Student at various levels. Student admission. Okay, let's talk about student admission. Uh, very interesting. Uh, student, students are ad admitted, and, and this is a real challenge at Stanford. Stanford, perhaps you know, has become now one of the most selective universities in the United States in terms of its undergraduate admission, most sought after. Okay, so how are you going to make this admission, this, this thing? So the admission committee, there is a committee that does this. They're not made of faculty, professional people who try to work on admission, okay, um, are looking for people who will bring some unique characteristic to Stanford. And what they're saying, or what I've heard them say is, no matter what we do, there will always be a bottom third of the class, right? mathematical fact bottom third we don't care that's a fact it's going to happen we want everyone at Stanford to be offering something special so there's a lot of emphasis put on on what you bring in your application to Stanford and it, it, not only in terms of grades but what accomplishments you've done have you already uh, done something with a musical instrument have you done something in terms of acting? Are you in sports uh, some type of star? I mean, all this matters. I hope I'm making clear to you. It also matters still at Stanford if you are the son or daughter of someone who's gone to Stanford. That certainly helps you. That's called legacy, okay? And that again goes with the idea that Stanford is after, uh, actually it's a private institution that depends on money <laughs> and people who, who contribute. I hope I'm getting across the, the situation. But that's a small amount, but it's, it's there. I, I don't want you to say otherwise, think otherwise. Hope I'm helping. Uh, let, let me show you, okay? Let's actually look at some of the facts. Uh, small you question. You talked about the undergraduate admissions. Yes. But how about the graduate school? Oh, there, there, there are people apply to the, to the, to the department. And uh, the, again, there's a departmental committee that looks at all the applications and they're looking for people who, again, what have they done as an undergraduate? Have they done some research? Have, have, they, have they actually published, been involved in a publication? Uh, what do people say about them? How well is their grades? Anything more you can know? And then try to make a balance. If you have people, uh, I'm, I'm just gonna speak about, uh, well, whatever field you want. There's normally subfields, you, and you have faculty in these subfields. You want to make sure you have graduate students that will go into these subfields. You're also looking at that too, and trying to make something that, you, not that you're trying to make one person go to one other person, but you're trying to bring in some mix like that. I, I thought what I'd do next is actually show you some statistics. Um, less, okay? Let me try. Let's see if I can make this run. So we'll begin. Uh, this is just something you can get and download called Stanford Facts 2019. And I'm gonna try to look, look at this. Um, yeah, I, I am sure I'm going to. Thank you. That's what I'm gonna point out. Okay. Here's the, 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 the founding. Uh, here is indeed what I was showing you, that's Leland Stanford Sr., that's the son, that's the mother, okay. Um, and you see various dates, and I, I, I tell you, it took off. Uh, what more can we do? Okay, class of 2022. They're gonna be 1697. This is now the undergraduates. Notice gender balance, 49% women, 51% men, okay, okay. High schools, 61% public, 25% private, 13% international. So international is way down among the um, uh, undergraduates. And it costs a lot of money. And so it 
tends to really uh, not be the same. They want to increase that, but that's how it's been. Stanford tries to be o pretty open. Okay, let, let's go on. Let me try to do this. Okay, and that's showing you all, all types of undergraduates and how they succeeded. Um, it gives you the ethnic diversity, if I can read it. So less than 1% is American Indian, 22% are Asian, 6% are black, 16% are Hispanic, 10% international, less than 1% Native Hawaiian, okay, 9% uh, are two or more races, 1% is unknown, and 34% is white. It's really a mix. Even, and that, that's among the undergraduates. The graduate students are even more mixed, as that's going to lead to. And, oh, I forgot to tell you about financial aid. We admit people on a need-blind basis because we have enough money. We couldn't do this without a big endowment. How big is our endowment? Listen to me, 26 billion, that's a thousand million dollars, okay? And that, that we are one of the richest universities in the United States. Harvard's richer, okay, I'm not trying to get you this, but we are among the top universities that way, huh? Top five, okay, so you get a, get a sense of what I'm saying to you about this. And that allows us to, to try to find the, 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 these, these undergraduates. And again, I'm telling you, we're looking for undergraduates who bring unique types of talent into the Stanford. We're, so, so, so we could choose, because we're so popular, we could choose a class that would all be first in their class of high school. We do not do that. Do, do, I hope I'm making, hmm? Um, uh, incidentally, I teach freshman chemistry uh, often. I, I have for many years. And uh, I have a problem, because I teach an honors freshman chemistry, I have in the past. Um, but I need to tell my class, which is made up of these people who have been what we call valedictorians, the leaders of their, their school uh, and so forth, that I'm going to give you the first exam. And I'm sorry, there's nothing I can do about it, but half of you are going to turn out to be below average on this exam. They've never been below average before in their life, okay? <laughs> but it, it's gonna be that way. And then I tell them, well, that's, a, that's true what I've just told you, that's not what's important. What's important is what you learn and that I actually grade the course, not on a curve of some sort of how many, but rather what you will show me that you've mastered. If you all master the material very well, you'll all get A's, and if not, you won't, <laughs> okay? And I, I use that. They first are not sure they believe me, but they catch on, that I'm, I'm truthful about that, okay? And this helps. And, but this is a big shock for people who come to Stanford. You have to first understand who, who they're with. The advantage of a place like Stanford, believe it or not, are the people, are the other undergraduates that you're with, uh, graduate students, they learn from each other. That's what, you know, is it, is it that Stanford faculty are so much better than whatever you want to take? Let's pick, let's pick Iowa State. Uh, is this another place? Okay, no, I'm sorry, they're not. There's some wonderful people at Iowa State or Ohio University State or whatever you, you want to pick, Michigan. It's that there is a collection like this and it, it is also as I was trying to tell you the ability of everybody to interact with each other it makes a full university I like it very much that way okay let's let's just go on for a moment with this if I can because this seemed to be loaded with good data uh, here are the graduate students okay let's take a look at the graduate students if I can read it okay so here are our graduate students at Stanford. And gender balance, 42% women, 58% men, okay? Here are the majors by school, 38% in engineering, 23% in humanities and sciences, 13% in medicine, 11% in business, 7% in law. Here's earth sciences, 4%, 3% education, okay? Uh, we get a sense. And then here's the geographical diversity that I was telling you about. 34% international. So, so when I tell you that one third is this way, uh, this shows what I'm saying, that, it, that it's so. Uh, uh, here, 15% are Asian. Uh, this is the eth ethnic diversity um, and, and so on. And we go through this and you can read it. So I don't have to read it to you. 
and you get a, a, a sense this way. Um, and here's postdocs, okay? Again, it turns out 42% women, 58% men. Seems to be the same balance. <laughs> Interesting, okay? And um, a, a large number, and this goes on. I, I, you can read all this. I'm not going to bother you with this. Here's the faculty profile. The faculty profile doesn't keep up with our student body yet. It's lacking in time. Look, 30% women, 70% men. Still, that's impressive. Indeed, one of the things that I tried to do when I was chair was to increase the number of women in my own department, and I did succeed. Enough now that that's no problem. <laughs> it was a problem when I became chair, there was only one woman. Now, now there, there, there are four in my department. Okay, um, a, a member of 24, it makes a difference. Okay, uh, and what do we see here? Uh, I wanted to show you what we had in terms of uh, faculty, we have 2,200 faculty, okay? How many staff do you think we have? And I'm showing you, 8,700. We have approximately four staff people for every faculty person. That's interesting. Now, some of us on the faculty think that's too many. <laughs> On the other hand, we get a number of great services. I'm trying to give you a, a, a contrast that goes on here. So the, you know, the word administration should be ad magistration because it just seems to grow. <laughs> We're worried about that. At least the faculty are. <laughs> okay. Um, hope I'm, I'm, I'm showing you this. And uh, okay, uh, what do we have? Different institutes whole bunch. And you can see them named here that I was mentioning to you. Um, from and places, you know, from Jasper Ridge, Biological Preserve, to Hopkins Marine Station. Um, oh, technology licensing. Let's talk about that. That, that may interest you. Um, we really live at Stanford in a place that encourages people to interact with industry. And we uh, are careful about this. We don't, we don't want graduate students or postdocs to feel that they're working for some company, not for, the, for learning. So we're very careful about some of those arrangements. But we have it such that if you patent something, the university will take about one-third the royalties, the department will take one-third, or how it's divided among departments, depending on how many, and one-third to the inventors, okay? And that means the university will do the, all the work. So the patents don't belong to the individual that are done at Stanford. They're divided up this way, and it works quite well, I believe, in general. It, it, it's, a good, it's a good system uh, for what, what's happening. I don't know yet, I have to learn what goes on at Ithers. Uh, almost the same? Very good, okay. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, I, I find this is Im Im important to have it work that way. Uh, we really, in the United States, celebrate success. And, and I'm, I'm, what I mean by that is uh, if I see somebody driving a, let's make it a Porsche, a uh, fancy car, I say, oh wow, person's done well. Now, if I go to Sweden, and someone drives a Porsche in Sweden, other people say, he must be cheating on his taxes. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be serious what I'm saying to you. There's a different attitude. There's an attitude of, in one place of wanting to level everything, and in another place, we're quite happy to have people really excel. We're happy about that, okay? And that's part of the attitude. Uh, and we encourage people, at least I do, to go fulfill themselves and however they do. And so, to me, it's okay that VJ Pandey has now become a venture capitalist. <laughs> and and, it's, and uh, fine, okay? And just to get a sense of what I'm, what I'm trying to say. People can go and do different things. And uh, all the way. Now, uh, I don't know, how long have I been at this? Wow, <laughs> it's 6-12. <6 -12. laughs> when did we start? 
Yeah, we started at just about an hour ago. Right. So, is there are there more? Oh, one more thing I wanted to show to share with you, which which I think will come perhaps as a surprise. People think that Silicon Valley. This is a common myth. They say, oh, Silicon Valley has come because of all the wonderful intellectual inventions made at Stanford. This is what people believe outside. It's actually quite false. Um, very, that's not what drives Silicon Valley. What drives Silicon Valley is the trained people that Stanford and Berkeley and others produce that go there, as well as foreign people who come there, okay? And it, it becomes a culture Really, innovation requires a culture. And we're deeply involved in Silicon Valley with innovation. This is not true throughout my whole country at all. I'm, 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 I come from Ohio. I was born there. Ohio is not known for its innovation. Cleveland. <laughs> okay, it, that's not what it's about. Okay, But where I live, it is very much what it's about. Uh, people look for that. Um, and, and so uh, almost all faculty members in my department one way or another are either consulting for some company or have had students start a company that come from them and, and so forth. They're serving on boards with a company. And so you, you get a sense. That's fine. And that makes it real. Uh, I like that personally, that combination. So I better stop here and thank you all. <laughs> uh, yes, sir. So. I, I have a question regarding grad school admission, basically. So the thing is, uh, in ICER, as you were talking about interdisciplinary knowledge, so ICER aims at giving interdisciplinary knowledge to students. Uh, so what ends up happening is we end up having an interest in a wide variety of topics, maybe within a department say biological sciences, but say on biophysics, biochemistry, microbio, so on a variety of things. So when we are applying for the grad school admission program, and if somebody gets called for an interview, is that taken into account? Like the, does the interview board or the- well, First of all, we, we, we don't tend to interview graduate students. We tend to select them by, based on uh, telephone conversations and, and paper. Uh, okay. Okay. Just so you know, okay, uh, there's so many graduate students that would be um, something we couldn't afford to do is to bring them in to interview. Okay, uh, no, but, like but, the but, but Skype you, but, interviews. But put, put down. I would urge anybody put down all the different things you've done. People are looking for that. Sir, regarding the, the Skype interviews, like the final oh, interview. Oh, that's oh Skype interviews fine. Yes, that, that is good. That works too. That's a telephone to me. That's just a video phone. Yes, sir. So it's like <laughs> our. Are varied interests taken into account when oh, yes. we are called for that interview? Again, stage. it depends on different different faculty. But I'm giving you my, my attitude, and I think the attitude of most faculty is absolutely yes. Okay, we, so we thank wanna, you. Sir. We're looking for people who are versatile and uh, who are flexible. Um, if you are coming as a graduate student and it's your idea, I'm only going to work in this one area. That actually limits you greatly. If you, if you instead say you're open to all possibilities, people are looking for that. We're always trying to find a fit. More? Well, thank, thank you all. Yeah. So if there are more questions, uh, please join me uh, thanking uh, Dick for the wonderful. Thank you. <coughs> and tomorrow we come back right here uh, by four. Uh, he's going to give a research talk in the form of our institute colloquium. Uh, so there'll be, uh, he'll talk about his own research. And uh, before we uh, actually close the session, I'd also like to call upon <laughs> Professor Umapati, uh, so who is uh, our director at this point. So Professor Umapati, if you have something to say. Please. I have nothing to say. I'm just. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you. I've just come today. You know, I. Uh, you know that I'm also an officiating director, not a permanent director, and I hope that I don't have to stay here too long. Um, you get a proper full-time director. 
Uh, I've already seen in the last two hours, tons of work needs to be done. And I will do whatever I can in the next few months or few weeks that I'm here. Um, and I see quite a lot of difference between Aysar Bhopal and Aysar Mohali, uh, in the way that you guys uh, do your academics and research. Uh, but let's see, whatever I can, I'll do my best to make sure that uh, for the students, uh, all the facilities uh, uh, and academic standards are high maintained, and of course the faculty to maintain high quality teaching and high quality research. I mean, that's our job and that's what we'll try to do. Right? I'm here to help you to do that, and I will do uh, whatever I can uh, to help you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. And there should be some tea uh, outside, so thanks all for coming.